All right. So let's get started on the real agenda of my talks, quantum chaos and uh, random matrix theory. Uh, but OK, not yet. So I just want to emphasize one point by showing this picture that we were talking about chaotic systems, fully chaotic systems, ergodic mixing, and all those things. And we introduced this simple example of a baker. Did not discuss it in detail. It's there in the, it's there in the notes. But it's a quintessential simple example, exactly solvable. Maybe I should stress this point that uh, chaos is not incompatible with solvability. Typically is, but it's also not true that integrable systems can all be solved. Okay, so solvability is a kind of a human preoccupation, doesn't have much to do with dynamics, although it's correlated apparently. So anyway, so the Baker's map, named after the baker who's baking the dough, I mean the, the uh, uh, you know, the bread. So is taking this piece of dough which is shaped conveniently in a square, unit square, and then pushing it so that it's in this rectangle, same volume, cutting it into one half and placing it on top. This, this second half, you place it on top there. So there's stretching and then there's folding. The stretching is what is leading to instability. And uh, we said that it was a complete left shift on, uh, on, on Q and P, that is, if you express Q in binary, A1, A2, dot, 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 and P, A1, A minus 1, A minus 2, A minus 3. So this is the momentum, initial momentum, initial position. That's a point on this phase space. Then the dynamics is deterministic and takes you to P1, Q1, which is dot a1 a2 dot, dot, dot a0 a minus 1 a minus 2 dot. so the left shift exposes completely the uh, uh, the uh, phenomenon of chaos because this left shift is going to uh, whatever accuracy you may have your q and p after uh, uh, after k time steps is going to shift all of those significant bits to the left and all the uh, errors that, I mean, the region of ignorance is going to be exposed soon. And, but the point which I want to emphasize here is that although there is all this sensitive dependence on initial conditions and so on, I mentioned one of the conditions of chaos is a dense set of periodic orbits. So this, in, so Pratrak Svitanovich calls it the skeleton on which the flesh of chaos is soon. And in fact, that is the, they, they form a very important set. Both classically and semi-classically, which then determines quantum mechanics. But these periodic orbits, they have their, their, their dense is a terminology, uh, mathematical terminology, which means that uh, the closure is the entire set, but for us, it just has to mean that arbitrarily close to any point in phase space, pick arbitrarily any point, and arbitrarily close to that, you will find a periodic orbit. So they are everywhere in phase space, but they're also, because they are chaotic, they are unstable. That's the most crucial point, they're also unstable. And because they are unstable, they are isolated. They don't form a continuous family of periodic orbits, unlike you may think harmonic oscillators also are like that. Because after all, you have periodic orbits everywhere. It's not just dense. Every point is a periodic orbit. A, it's not unstable. B, it's not isolated. They are arbitrarily close to that. Not only arbitrarily, there's actually a continuous family of orbits which are, uh, uh, which are periodic. So integrable systems are of that kind they would be having stable, non-isolated families of periodic orbits. Whereas chaotic systems have isolated periodic orbits. In the Baker's map, you can easily enumerate them. It's just like for the left shift dynamics that we saw.
And here I just wanted to show you the, uh, you can easily enumerate exactly the periodic orbits. You don't have to do any numerical things except to plot it. So here you see uh, periodic orbits of the Baker's map, period 5, 10, and 15. All periodic orb points of period 5, and there are 32 of them, it goes exponentially, 2 to the power 5, are here. They are pretty uniformly spread. And here there are 10, which means there is 1,024 of them. And uh, they are, as you can see, they form interesting patterns. They are not periodic. I mean, it, it's not like a crystalline structure. It's, in fact, quite interesting structure, maybe. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, it's uniformly spread. In fact, this goes, this, uh, this is stated more clearly in a theorem due to Hane and Osorio Almeida. Uh, but I'm not going to state the theorem, but uh, the, uh, the theorem basically is about how these unstable periodic orbits are spread in phase space, and if the chaos is uniform, that is, uh, let's say the hyperbolicity is uniform, that is, all parts of phase space are stretching and folding uniformly, as in the Baker's map, then they will be actually uniformly spread. That's what you're seeing here. And if they're not, if there are regions that are more unstable, there will be more periodic orbits in the unstable region. It will be more dense where it's unstable. And uh, that is uh, 15. So they are all periodic orbits there filled up. So you can think about one model of this useful model of a periodic orbit, and it's more than a model, it's that of rational numbers on the real line. They also have all of these properties. Rational numbers are dense. Rational numbers are dense, arbitrarily close to any number. You can find a rational number. They are isolated. They are a point set. In fact, they are, we discussed measure yesterday. If you were to measure them, they are a set of measure zero. And periodic orbits are also like that. The measure of them is zero. That means that almost all orbits are not periodic. Nevertheless, it's a dense set. And so, therefore, also a very important set. Okay. So, with that, let me actually go on to uh, discussions of what happens when, uh, or, or a subject which is largely known as quantum chaos. So, quantum chaos, uh, I, I would say, started sometime in the 1970s even early 70s through a, because that was also the time when chaos was becoming understood. The word chaos was brought into scientific uh, usage, I think around 1976, in the paper titled Period 3 Implies Chaos by Lee and York. But even before that, people were well aware of uh, these uh, phenomena of uh, irregular motion, as they used to call it, or stochastic motion in deterministic systems. And uh, so it, it's got a, a fairly long history involving chemists, physicists, uh, and mathematicians. But uh, so le let me, I have uh, given an introduction of that. So basically, what is the question? The question is, we know many simple systems that display classical chaos. Hamiltonian, I'm always talking about Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian classical chaos. And we saw several examples of them, billiards, uh, maps, and so forth. Uh, so the question is, of course, that basically we believe that the world is, that the description is quantum mechanics. What happens in the quantum domain? If you were to quantize any of these systems, how are they, how is this classical chaos manifest itself in the quantum domain? Uh, no, so a positive Lyapunov exponent means instability, but for example, even if you take the uh, oscillator like this, it has a positive Lyapunov exponent, but it's not chaotic, it just runs away, it's just unstable. Or if you take the pendulum, the orbit which is 
you know, this separatrix thing, it's unstable. It'll have a positive Lyapunov exponent. So a positive Lyapunov exponent, for example, let's just take this abstract twice xn. No chaos, positive Lyapunov exponent of log 2, because every point would be shipped. So you need, if you have Lyapunov exponent, but if your phase space is bounded, I think that's practically a good recipe for chaos. But a definition, you would require at least one of the other things, namely ergodicity, along with ergodicity, or with a dense set of periodic orbits. So if it is ergodic and if it has a positive Lyapunov exponent, then it's chaotic. Okay, so, um, so we would not call this chaotic, but we will call this chaotic, and it is chaotic. Like if you just don't put a modulo one, there are no periodic orbits except this trivial fixed point at zero. There's no other periodic orbit. Once you put modulo one, you have infinity of periodic orbits on the system. Similarly with the cat map, which we discussed, if you don't put it on a torus, it's just a linear map, it has only the origin as a fixed point. If you put it, you have exactly this kind of fixed points, which I showed for the Baker's map. Harder to calculate, but interesting problem. OK, so question is what happens in the quantum domain? And uh, that is a vague question, but there are several things. So one of the most important uh, things that people were concentrating on a spectra, by which I, usually one means eigenvalues, but I will say stationary, so eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And then time evolution. They are related, they could be related in a, uh, uh, just as, uh, if you know the spectrum, you can time evolve. But question is, how are these things are impacting on these things, these manifestations? So, the stationary states were what was studied first. So let's say that we have a Hamiltonian H, which is classically chaotic. Uh, to fix ideas, you might think of Billiards, which we discussed a bit. So here is a circular billiard, no chaos, integrable, a stadium billiard, two semicircular arcs, line in between, uh, fully chaotic. So you might think of now the quantum mechanics of uh, a particle which is trapped in this. So the Hamiltonian operator in that case minus h bar square twice m. So del square, there is no potential. It's a free motion, which is there on this. So the stationary state Schrodinger equation is just this solutions to this, to this problem, a free particle. And the important thing is in the boundary conditions. So this is vanishing on the boundary equals zero when x belongs to the boundary of the surface s. So if this is s, and that's the boundary, the Dirichlet boundary conditions, it vanishes on that. So that's the requirement, and that's the most important thing. You know, for example, how to solve for this billiard, a rectangular billiard of length L1 and L2, and you know that the, the eigenvalues depend on two quantum numbers, n and m, and we go as h bar squared, pi squared, by twice m, maybe I'm missing something, so n squared by l1 squared, m squared by l2 squared. Uh, this m and this m conflict, sorry. So n1, n2 maybe, n1, n2, twice n. Okay, so that's just really a separable two wells that we solve in a first course. But the important thing is that it depends on two integers or quantum numbers that go from zero, I'm sorry, one, two, dot, dot, dot. So the ground state corresponds to both one, etc. Now, the fact that there are two quantum numbers in this is a crucial thing, and it actually comes from the fact that 
the system is integrable, the fact that there are two constants of motion. So we discussed integrability, and if there is d constants of motion, you call it integrable. And in fact, the fact that this spectrum depends on, uh, there are these quantum numbers that come is simply because of these actions, which are conserved. And that was the original, you know, pre Schrodinger uh, quantum mechanics, that the actions are quantized. It's not the energy which is quantized, but take the action and you quantize them. And actually in a D degree of freedom system, we have D independent actions for an integrable system. And therefore you'll have D quantum numbers. So here are the cases too, and you have this. The question is, how, do these, how does the spectrum energy look in this case? I mean, I, this, is, this involves some Bessel functions, slightly more complicated. So this one here, question is, are there, first of all, these quantum numbers, and what are these? Well, there are no other constants of motion except energy. So in fact, one does not expect a second quantum number. There is no quantum number in this case, except the energy itself. So there is only one quantum number we can, so there is no other further thing. So this is parameterized really by only one integer n, which is just telling you where you are on the spectrum. And so we can also mark the energies en. There's only one subscript really. Uh, in this case of the non-integrable situation. Of course, this describes everything. So the solution of this problem it's not so easy for the billiard. You need to go to the computer. You need to do calculations. In fact, this was, I think, the very first, well, okay, not entirely accurate, but I would say that a detailed calculation of uh, a quantum chaotic system was uh, uh, such a billiard. Okay, I'm talking too much. So maybe we, uh, so, okay, so uh, uh, let me give a broad area of, uh, a broad kind of things that people have done, and I should say, as I said, 1970s, I should say that the uh, timeline of things, maybe 1976, quantum maps, uh, so Michael Berry is going to appear in most of these works, so Berry, Balash. Oros and Tabor. Tabor also has a book. You can read about it. So 1976, quantum maps. We saw classical maps, like the standard map. So this was a quantization of uh, these systems. So they are, uh, they are simple enough to study. 1979 is another quantum map. It's a standard map on the cylinder. And I would say that this started off a very important uh, series of things, which is now known as dynamical localization, has connections to Anderson localization in disordered systems. So dynamical localization, 1979, is again four authors, Ford, Rasati, uh, Israelev, and Shirikov after whom also the standard map is partially named, the Chirikov map. So, it's 1979, this is, uh, this is all quantization of the uh, standard map on the cylinder and the finding of dynamical localization. Then the 80s was a very... Uh, the large amount of uh, studies on semi-classics. So, I would... I would say phenomenology. Phenomenology means numerical experiments because you can't solve things exactly almost always uh, abound and they are central to our understanding. So we will first look at some phenomenology. We have to have some idea. I mean, we think we know how regular systems, at least well, what we mean by that is usually one dimensional systems, how they look. But we think we understand more of regular systems, but we have to train our neural networks to see probably uh, uh, things which have a classical limit that's chaotic. Semi-classics forms a very important uh, tool, a analytical tool to approximating these things. And uh, so the WKB method, which we study, is really designed for one-dimensional systems because we quantize tori, for example. We, we quantize really, you know, we, 
we say that there is these things are orbits in phase space, and we find some action of this integral PDQ, which is the area, and we say that that's equal to NH. So this is actually, as I said, pre-quantum mechanics, bohr sommerfeld condensation, and it's actually, okay, prehistory, 70s, 80s, go back a little bit in time, it's 1917, the paper of Einstein, no less, who questioned about this kind of quantization, he said, this is fine, and if we go to d degrees of freedom, and if they are separable, he said, what happens to this rule? Well, if they are separable, it's quite simple, it is already done, there will be these uh, i uh, degrees of freedom which are independent, and you'll have, uh, you'll have these d quantum numbers, exactly like the particle in a rectangular box. 1 to d. But if they are not separable, but still integrable, Einstein made an important observation, which actually goes back to the fact that then the motion lie on tori. It's integrable, but action lie on tori. Remember, go back to arnold liouville theorem. So these lie on a d-dimensional tori. Let's just think for our purpose is two-dimensional, you can put two to be d. Two-dimensional torus, which we are imagining and which we can draw. There are two inequivalent circuits here, topologically. One that goes around like this, one that goes around like this, C1 and C2. And it's quite remarkable that, so now we have this momentum, it's now a vector, it's not a separable thing. So dot dq, this has to be quantized. But what do you take this integral over? So Einstein said that you have to take them over these circuits which are irreducible, and that defines for you these quantum. And you may say that what if I take another circuit here, which is like this, if they are topologically equivalent, then these numbers are the same. So these are what are called Lagrangian manifolds, and they have this property. And therefore, this, there are only N, a D quantum numbers in this. So this was realized by Einstein, but at the same time, he also realized that you don't all have this kind of tori always. So he raised the question, but he left it unsolved, what happens if there are no such tori? And uh, he cites Poincaré's uh, study on the three-body problem, to say that there do exist systems like that, and now we know that most of the systems are like that. Now, uh, so this has, uh, but, but even with this uh, integrable systems, there was a long uh, history be, be behind, uh, after that, an important contribution due to Keller and Maslow, and they modified these things, and there is some, you know, the harmonic oscillator has a one-half put in there, that's also got a semi-classical interpretation, and this is the Maslow indices, so they were uh, finally kind of, uh, 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 one might say that one understood semi-classics of integrable systems with this thing, yeah. For non-integrable systems, after Einstein, it was Gutzwiller, a bit before 80s really, but in the 80s this was developed extensively, who used, uh, the path integral formalism made use of these unstable periodic orbits, which I showed at the, uh, for the Baker's map. For every chaotic system, you have these unstable periodic orbits, and he expressed things like density of states as some sums. I'm just writing completely, uh, you know, completely in a, uh, I'm not writing accurately, but just as a, representation really, as sums like these, which is a sum over periodic orbits, all periodic orbits on an energy shell of energy E, classical. So this information which goes into this is completely classical. Actually, this, this is the oscillating part. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what is the oscillating part. And so the density of states has a smooth part, it's called a D-bar. This is what we usually study in statistical mechanics, and then an oscillating part. 
This oscillating part is actually what is going to give you the energy eigenvalues exactly. So that's a sum over all periodic orbits. This depends on the stability of the periodic orbits. These are the actions of the periodic orbits, so it's similar to this kind of actions. But now they're all isolated, and as you see, there's an infinity of these periodic orbits. So the sum, so it was a, it is still not a complete story as to how to control these sums, whether uh, in what sense are they convergent and so on. It's probably a mathematician's nightmare. So, uh, but nevertheless, a lot of practical information uh, 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 was derived from there. Not only that, very important connections were made to random matrix theory and continues to be made. So it's a very important thing, but I won't be having time in these lectures to dwell on the semi-classics. But a huge amount of uh, development of semi-classics, several people involved, which will vary again. Oros and others. Random matrix theory, which I'll discuss uh, a little bit, was how statistics, so uh, it was realized that uh, the, 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 the spectra of this, especially both of them, eigenvalues and eigenvectors actually, had certain properties, statistical properties, which were usefully described by things which were invented long back for a slightly different purpose, and actually quite different purpose, I would say real invention of it, so, but random matrix theory. So we'll, we'll look at that uh, uh, in more detail. That was in the 1980s again. Actually, it's quite interesting that if you see the papers, so one of the papers which is attributed to that is 1984. Bohigas, Inoni, and Schmidt. But Actually, there were precursors in many people's work which, which indicated that random matrix theory could have been, would be useful in the description of these kind of simple, simple systems. Experiments, there's a, a huge set of experiments because, well, practically everything is really non-integrable. If you take a hydrogen, one of the earliest experiments was really hydrogen atom in microwave fields. So, a hydrogen atom, the you know, the uh, atom which started off quantum mechanics was, but if you subject it to a, 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 to a time varying field, it's like those one degree of freedom systems which we studied with time, time dependence, like this forced pendulum which we started out with. A parametrically forced pendulum could lead to chaos. So similarly, a hydrogen atom with sufficiently strong fields can go into very complicated behavior. There could be ionization of the electron, but before the ionization, it can go to excited Rydberg states, and it's quite a complicated phenomenology. These kind of experiments were done early on, and then hydrogen atoms in strong magnetic fields, weak magnetic fields, you have Zeeman effects, strong magnetic fields, meaning of the order of Teslas, where the magnetic uh, forces then compete with the Coulomb forces. And now you're breaking the symmetry. So if you think about the hydrogen atom having complete spherical symmetry, by putting a field in one direction, you're breaking that, and therefore, you're breaking the integrability of the system. With strong enough fields, you're breaking the symmetry strong enough. And if you treat the problem classically, it's actually chaotic, and there's manifestations of that. So a lot of atomic physics experiments. Nuclear data, it started out from there, although we don't have microscopic Hamiltonians for that. Uh, quantum optics, Josephson junction qubit, so recently a lot of experiments, no, recently really 20 years, cold atoms and so forth, and then with uh, quantum information and quantum computing, so with the qubit language, there's a fair amount of, uh, a fair amount of experiments, especially these days when one is exploring thermalization. Thermalization naturally occurs in a non-integrable context, so a few body experiments which preserve the quantum state's purity for sufficiently long time to observe interesting effects. Uh, so those are ongoing experiments. A lot of experiments, I would say, very different fields. Quantum maps, as I said, they have been quantized over the years. They form simple models, but also some of them are experimentally realizable, including the quantum Baker's map. I will discuss that a little bit, what it means. But the, quantum, the Baker's map, as you saw, is a solvable model. It was quantized by Balash and Voros, and 
it involves just Fourier transforms. And as you know, uh, the quantum Fourier transform forms an important ingredient in algorithms. So <laughs> you can implement the Baker's map uh, uh, experimentally that has been done uh, to some extent. OK, so billiards, billiards is uh, quantum dots. It's just a, part in, uh, so a clean quantum dots without any disorder or uh, uh, put in there. So uh, these experiments have been done for, for a while. So ballistic, so to speak, ballistic quantum dots, there'll be some leads. And then depending on the shape of this billiard, whether it's regular or, uh, or like this, there are very different transport properties. And, uh, uh, and so this, was all, this has also been explored for, for a while. Um, Nonlinear oscillators. Well, this are related to atomic physics kind of things, but they are very interesting models. I'll describe a little bit. Uh, one of the original uh, models in which uh, you know computation was done was the Fermi pasta Ulam problem, which you know is a, is a, a, a well if if you don't also it's just harmonic oscillators and small anharmonicities put in there. The idea of uh, Fermi pasta and Ulam was to see whether there is uh, equidistribution of energy among the modes. So it's the first uh, numerical experiment uh, on the computer. And uh, well, that's another story. So the last piece here that I think I have, where there is quantum chaos, is a very odd entry. And uh, it has to do with So I just mentioned it here, but you could, I, I, I don't think I'll be going into details, the Riemann zeta function. Nothing to do with dynamics, completely accident of history maybe, but I'll, I'll probably come back to this when I'm discussing random matrix theory. And maybe I should actually postpone this till, I, uh, till, till we go to random matrix theory. But just as a, as a preview, the zeros of the Riemann zeta function the non-trivial zeros of the Z Riemann zeta function, which is simply defined as this. Z is complex. This is valid description when the real part of Z is greater than 1. Otherwise, you have to analytically continue it. The non-zero, non-trivial zeros lie on this line. That's the Riemann conjecture, that all of them lie on this line. And if you take the zeros on this line, They are symmetric about this axis, about the y-axis. These zeros, they are having properties of the eigenvalues or the spectra of quantized chaotic systems in terms of fluctuation properties. So that, that means a like connection to random matrices and there's this uh, uh, things. And, uh, and this is one of the uh, uh, open problems, the famous Riemann conjecture that all of the non-trivial zeros lie here. Analysis of these zeros, fascinating part, and there exists, uh, one of the uh, things is that we need to have a lot of data to analyze it. Actually, the Riemann zeta is a nice example that way. You have a lot of zeros, and uh, uh, I don't know, some 10 power 10 or something. You can also download many of them. At least they used to be available. I think probably they still are. Odlesko computed a lot of them and shared half of them, probably, with the world. And you could use that to analyze uh, many things. And not only that, actually, the Riemann zeta function has, see, the connection of the Riemann zeta function to uh, why the Riemann zeta function is interesting because of this Euler product formula which is a product over all prime numbers. So this has implications on prime numbers if you know the properties of this. So that's why it's interesting. And then there are also uh, very interesting connections of this to the semi-classic. So there are formulas for this from mathematics, which have no uh, uh, you know, semi-classical uh, motivations, but uh, they are exactly of the form of the 
uh, uh, of the Goodswiller trace formula. So one also learned some things of how to uh, how to control these uh, uh, these expansions uh, from already what was done with the Riemann zeta function. But that's something which is ongoing. Okay, scattering systems, spin chains, more recent probably, I don't know. So this do, these don't have classical limits. You can ask what about systems don't have classical limits. We don't know that there's chaos. So that's where the random matrix theory usually steps in. And since we know how uh, a quantized non-integrable system, if it has a classical limit which is chaotic, will have some fluctuations which are like random matrix theory. Usually models which don't have classical limits, transfers, I mean icing models with fields in uh, transfers in longitudinal directions, for example, you will find spectra which are as if they are coming from a quantized uh, non-chaotic uh, system. So this is a large uh, 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 area of ongoing uh, uh, studies. Maybe if I have time, I'll say something. About it. I won't say anything about it. quantum chromodynamics. So any at this point. I've talked for 45 minutes, I think, so any comments or observations? Uh, uh, so the, the argument usually goes that there is no quantum chaos because of the following reason. Since, since classical chaos is sensitive dependence on initial conditions, and we know that, uh, that in quantum mechanics, the evolution of a state is unitary, so we evolve this for some time t, and we get the state at a later time. Uh, now, uh, let's take a state which is nearby, some phi prime zero, which is in some sense close to phi of zero. And we evolve it with the same Hamiltonian, and we get some other state, phi t prime. Now, what is the distance between these states? So one of the measures of a distance is the overlap. So if we were just to take the overlap between these two states evolved after a time t, that's equal to phi prime zero u dagger u phi zero. But being unitary, this is exactly identity, and this is phi prime zero phi zero. And therefore, the distance between these uh, states do not change at all with time because of unitary evolution. And also, Schrodinger equation, which I write down, derivative with respect to time, uh, can be it's total derivative. I have not put any representation. Is a linear equation. Uh, this is a linear operator, and uh, uh, therefore this, uh, in fact, if h is time independent, that's what uh, leads u to be just this unitary operator minus i h t over h bar. h being Hermitian, u is unitary and there is no. So that's one of the, uh, one of the reasons uh, why there uh, why uh, there could be no sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And this was addressed by uh, people very differently. For instance, uh, uh, sensitivity, so this is not a good way to look at how sensitive quantum systems are. So one of the ways in which it has been studied is to change the evolution itself slightly. So rather than change the state slightly, you could change the evolution slightly and then study the uh, the difference in that case, these unitary things don't uh, cancel each other, and then there is a very interesting uh, lot of work which goes under the name of Losh Meteko. So it's a big name for basically some things which you take as initial state, you evolve it with some Hamiltonian, and you go back in time if you wish, you can think about it in two ways, but let's say that we go back in time with a different Hamiltonian, and then look at what happens, how much of it is still remaining in that initial state. So that's the echo part of it. 
Uh, then you could study this. This is a fidelity measure. And people have analyzed that usefully as uh, to see the signatures of, uh, of quantum chaos. So for instance, just to, I won't go into detail, so I might as well mention it, that the fidelity decays with a classical Lyapunov exponent after some initial uh, generic decay, which is quadratic, it has, if there is chaos, it, it decays, uh, so in a, in a kind of log plot, it would, it, would be a, it would be a linear decay. So there's some exponential minus lambda t behavior. So this is a function of t log of ft, something like that. So the, uh, but actually what I want to uh, uh, say at this point is not that, uh, is that all of these arguments about linearity or about unitarity are misplaced because classical mechanics is also linear and unitary. The object that we are studying is a wave function or any state, the correct classical interpretation of this is as a distribution in phase space. It doesn't have a particular position in momentum. A state, well, unless it's a, it's a delta uh, function in, in that, it's a distribution in phase space, it's its usual thing. We'll come back to this, hopefully, shortly as to what exactly is this distribution in phase space. But my point is that the equivalent of, the, of a quantum state is not a point in phase space, but a distribution in phase space. And how does a distribution in phase space evolve? Classical. Huh? Lewell equation. And Lewell equation, linear, nonlinear? It's a linear, partial differential equation. And in fact, the evolution is unitary. So, Lewell equation d rho by dt equals zero is a statement about incompressibility of the flow is a linear partial differential equation. I'll just come back. So in fact, let us write this out as minus, or let me put the minus, uh, I hope I did that right, yeah, probably, h rho. Okay, let's define an operator, so that's the Poisson bracket. So that's the operator which will swallow a function by computing its Poisson bracket with h. So it's a linear operator, you can easily see that. So let's go, that's called the Lewell operator, not surprisingly, it depends on this Hamiltonian which is going to be put in there, that's rho. So this looks exactly like the Schrodinger equation which I wrote here. A first order derivative in time, instead of state, you have this density, an operator acting on, on rho, and in fact, the formal solution of this is rho at a time t is e to the power of the Liouvillian times time, rho at zero. Exactly like this, and in fact, this operator left as an exercise is unitary. So rather than looking at classical mechanics in phase space, I'm sorry, quantum mechanics in phase space, it's also useful, useful and it's actually possible to look at classical mechanics in the Hilbert space. Especially when you're studying statistical physics, I think it may be useful because these are about distributions. And there, there the evolution is unitary and is linear, yet of course there is underlying classical chaos and all the complexity of that. So those arguments are not really well founded, I would say. Yeah, but I don't want to go into, it was a question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's actually, the echo part of it comes from there. The Loschmidt part of it comes from, uh, I, I was talking about the Poincare recurrence theorem and the fact that it, things recur. So, and the fact that, I mean, so Loschmidt used that as an, uh, counter to Boltzmann's H theorem, so kind of motivated that. Yeah. 
You mean like due to uh, En of T kind of things? Yeah, sure, yeah. Partially, yes. So, I mean, if the Hamiltonian is not there, I mean, it's the same. Obviously, everything is eliminated. All of them are eliminated. So, the, quest, uh, the thing is, in fact, uh, it's an interesting point, is that when the Hamiltonian is slightly changed, how, are, how is the spectrum changed? The eigenvalues and eigenfunctions are changing. How are they changing? That will impact how the fidelity is changing. Yeah. Yeah. Which one? You know, that's a classical, uh, this was all classical. You mean the psi to, you mean this kind of thing here? Yeah, I haven't defined what rho is for a quantum system. It's just some phase space distribution. Yeah, or it could be a Wigner function, but it could be positive also. Wigner function will be negative, we'll come to that. You're ahead of me as you should be. Okay, any other questions? I don't want to discuss open systems, sorry. So, yeah, you can do that in quantum mechanics also equally. Okay, so I think we will look at some pictures, enough equations for the time being. Uh, yeah, so these are from my friend and collaborator, Ann Barker, so I've, uh, I felt free to steal pictures from his uh, habilitation thesis. Um, here is circular billiard. We saw this. And here is a cardioid billiard, fully chaotic, fully integrable. And now you uh, quantize it, look at energy eigenstate. So what is plotted here is modulus. So we solve the Schrodinger equation, stationary states. So del squared psi plus k squared psi equals zero. Psi vanishing on the boundaries. K squared is 2me by h bar squared. So wave number squared. So uh, this is the hundredth excited state. Thousand excited state, thousand five hundred, two thousand excited state. And what you see is that the wave function. So what is plotted here is what I was going to say was modulus psi x y squared. So the amplitude is plotted as a function of x and y. It vanishes on the boundary, and you can see very non-uniform distributions. There are patterns in these. And, uh, 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 and in fact, there is some understanding of these. There's pretty decent understanding of these based on the tori which are there in the phase space. If you quantize the cardioid billiard, here are some the similar 100, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. What you see is that so there are the, uh, the black are the high spots, and uh, uh, white are the low. So, Clearly, the wave number is, uh, for larger energies, the wave number is larger, so the wavelength is smaller. So that's what you're seeing. There's finer and finer structure in the states. But it's pretty much spread all over the place. And there are structures, nevertheless. There are these patterns. But it's somewhat like when you look through a kaleidoscope and you see random uh, bits of uh, glass forming beautiful patterns due to some reflection and so on. We may think that this is like that, but actually, well, in, in large part, in these eigenfunctions, these patterns are essentially because of the symmetry in these systems due to symmetry, due to reflection about this line. So essentially, there's some random pattern here, which is reflected here. Okay, so these are how, so it's it kind of filling up this entire uh, uh, area. It looks like ergodic. So maybe we see more pictures before I discuss it. So here is another, so here is just a bigger version of that uh, particular state. And I'll come to what is there here. But if I tell you that this one is a local 
uh, magnification of that uh, state, it looks believable, but actually it's not. It's, it's coming from a very different process. Just take it at the moment as something which is spread all over the uh, space. Hmm? In this case, actually it is uniform, but just take it as it's spread all over the space, as opposed to in the case of the circle, it's not spread all over the space. If you want to be, if you want to be, you can be more quantitative, and we will be quantitative in a short while, hopefully, but for the billiards, is essentially something like this. You take this intensity, and let's say that you integrate it over some domain, delta, this is in the, in the configuration space. Does this go towards the area of delta divided by the area of the billiard, total area of the billiard? It's like a mixing kind of thing, you know, is it like, in fact, that... As, and all of these things that I'm talking about is going towards the area and so on will need some smoothing, that's what I'm doing here. You can't look at a uh, eigenfunction at a particular point. So you take an average over this, and really, in, we are talking about some semi-classical H bar tending towards zero, very high energy excitations. Ground states are still quite different from these kind of things. Uh, so here is a, uh, uh, also the stadium. This is now the stadium billiard, uh, and uh, there are two states which are shown here, one which is like this and the other which is like this. So this state here has more, much more pattern. You can see that the intensities are just here in these. They are high in this, whereas here it's like distributed all, all over the place. Can you imagine what is this structure here? Why this structure here? Yes, uh, yeah, I mean, if you look very closely, of course, everything is an interference pattern, but just grossly, think classically, why are these things there? See, a stadium billiard has very chaotic orbits, we saw that, uh, we saw at least pictures of that, uh, but nevertheless, it has some very simple orbits, namely orbits that keep bouncing back and forth. If it's an exactly vertical orbit hitting this, this segment, it's just going to be particle in a box. It's just going to keep coming back and forth. These are bouncing ball orbits that are neutrally stable. That means that if you change them slightly, actually, well, they're neutrally stable in the sense that if you shift them horizontally like this, they, they remain stable. But if you give them a slight tilt, then they would become fully ergodic and chaotic. So, but because of the presence of a continuous family of these uh, orbits, so the stadium billiard quantum mechanics will show many unusual features such as these. But also there are other unusual features which you're seeing in states like these. And this was a uh, discovery of Heller, so um, uh, in 1984. And he looked at uh, these eigenstates doing high excited states and looking at them more closely. And he found that while several were like this, several also showed strong enhancement in certain regions. And this also, you can imagine, is a periodic orbit. In fact, it is a periodic orbit, but it's unstable and isolated. So it just goes back and forth on this end caps here. It's a highly un it's a unstable short periodic orbit. This is also a periodic orbit called a bow tie. And this uh, it, it, it scars certain states, like, like here, you can see some other things. So here, so this is not ergodic, it doesn't look like it's going to satisfy this. So there's a whole host of these kind of uh, possibilities. And it's not just billiards, a lot of calculations have been done with other systems, for example, nonlinear oscillators, here is a coupled harmonic and harmonic oscillator. So there's already quartic oscillator, x to the 4 plus y to the 4, 2 degrees of freedom. And you couple it with this uh, x square, y square. It's a homogeneous potential. If alpha is very large, it becomes chaotic. Alpha is large, it becomes chaotic. So here, some eigenfunctions uh, plotted again, modulus psi 
square, the intensity is plotted. What is seen is the configuration space of two consecutive states for alpha is some 64. That's the top one here. So alpha is 64, two consecutive states. You see this state, it's spread all over space except for the symmetries which make it uh, look pretty. To this state, the next one, it's completely localized or looks localized on this, which are periodic orbits, these channel orbits. And this is, uh, actually I can't seem to, well, to just that, maybe I need to scroll it. It's a similar thing, but just when alpha is 90, ah, I went through the whole thing, but the, ah, yeah. So this is alpha is 90, and uh, again, two consecutive states, and this one is more clearly visible. The difference between that and this is actually there has been a change of stability of that uh, uh, periodic orbit, which is uh, along this channel, and it's become stable here, actually. So it's, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's showing up in these eigenfunctions much more prominently. The X and Y. These are psi x and y modulus square, just as in the billiard. Yeah, the intensity is shown in. So, uh, 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 so there is actually a zoology of these eigenstates, and uh, uh, it's it's not uh, 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 there is no apparent general rule. Although there is a lot of understanding of these states uh, from several viewpoints, uh, there is no great systematics in this. But I want to talk about one systematics today, which is of uh, interest in the thermalization aspects of things. And actually, this is an early work, goes back to the 80s and uh, was revived somewhat when uh, the, the investigations into so-called eigenstate thermalization took place. And it goes back to this works of uh, other people, including, say, Michael Perry and Andre Voros. So, uh, the, one of the uh, uh, differences between what we have been doing classically and quantum mechanically is the following. Classically, we were always doing some dynamics. We were starting with some initial state, initial condition, we were evolving it. In quantum mechanics, we're looking at stationary states. They're not changing at all in time. So this difference between the stationary and this is because we, are, we were looking at, I mean, if you want to look at things which are not changing classically, you would look at invariant sets. Invariant sets, rather than at individual points. So let's illustrate that with a simple harmonic oscillator or any one-dimensional problem. So can you tell me what are the invariant sets for a harmonic oscillator? So now think of a set, not a point. Invariant means that as the flow happens, the set does not change. The ellipse itself is a set, the energy shell here is a set which is not changing. So this entire thing is a, a set. This is also a set. The equilibrium point is an isolated set. But otherwise, these are invariant sets. And in fact, as you know, if you were to quantize the harmonic oscillator and look at eigenfunctions of the harmonic oscillator, they have relationship to these ellipses. Usually, we don't see them in phase space, but we could. So maybe the first thing that we need to do is to look at states in phase space, and already the word Wigner function was mentioned, so it really goes back to Wigner, who had motivations from statistical physics to study distributions in phase space, and that's the definition of a Wigner function. So a Wigner function is a phase space representation of a state, and it's quadratic in the state in the sense that there's, there is, there's two psi, the psi, there is psi star, and they are evaluated at uh, Q plus X by 2 and Q minus X by 2, and then a Fourier transform is taken of that. Uh, have I written that correctly? Yeah. 
I Fourier transform integral 1 over 2 pi h bar, number of degrees of freedom, dx. You see, we have integrated out x, so it's a function of q and p. So it's a function which depends on the state psi and on q and p. So we should think of this q and p as in some phase space variables. So it's a pseudo phase space representation and so on. So it's a Wigner function widely used in many areas of physics. The, uh, the Wigner function is our uh, a, a, our uh, uh, classical lens into the uh, quantum world, but it's not that classical in the sense that uh, it was also mentioned that W can be negative, a Wigner function can be negative. So it's not really like a, a probability density, but it can be negative, but it's a, there's a price to, that's a, that's a price to pay for having a faithful representation of this wave function psi, namely, Given the Wigner function, we can invert it and find the state psi. So no information is lost. There are other entities that can do. You can uh, I'll probably talk about that if there is time. But we can integrate this uh, using some Gaussian smoothing. And that gives you what's called the Husimi function, which is positive. And that, so the Wigner function of the harmonic oscillator would be Concentrated, if you take a state with energy E, so that means that it's n plus one half h bar mega, so it will be on that n plus h bar h bar omega, it will be concentrated on that, the Wigner function. And there will be other non classical things, but we're not interested in that because of this. Uh, it's, uh, if you do the Husimi, it will be concentrated exclusively on this, uh, on this orbit. But uh, but a Wigner is slightly different. But for our purposes, the essential thing is that the Wigner function is on this energy shell. And as this energy increases, this localization on this energy shell gets tighter. So, so what happens in a integrable system which is not one dimensional, it's slightly more, it's, it's more complicated, but it's not that much more complicated. We know that there are these actions, there are D of them, so we'll put them in a vector, and they are constants, and they are functions of this Q and P, and there are these quantum numbers, we'll include also the mass law phases, P, H, Okay, and if the eigenstates, let's just have this model that the eigenstates are on this invariant set, then there's a delta function, which is a d-dimensional delta of this, and then there is some proportionality constant, but that's independent of, uh, I think I didn't write that, I'm not very sure of the normalization constant, but it's, a, it's something independent of h bar, h there, so that's equal to the Wigner function, which is uh, which depends on this quantum number m. So the state is characterized by this set of quantum numbers m, and the Wigner function is kind of is is residing on this torus, which is dictated by the set of quantum numbers. So this is a higher dimensional generalization of uh, uh, of what we just said. Okay, so this is an equality which has to be taken as, uh, you know, with some smoothing in these uh, things. It's not an exact equality. It's a semi-classical kind of equality. But what happens in an ergodic system, which is completely chaotic, and which has no other constant of motion other than energy? What are the invariant sets that you can think of? Huh? the energy shell is itself an invariant set. Can you think of some other invariant sets? 
There are an infinity of them. Yeah? Constants? No, there are no constants of motion in a completely non-integrable case. So we have just gone from the other end, one end to the other end. No other constant of motion except energy. What about periodic orbits? They also form invariant sets. Any thing on a periodic orbit, a periodic orbit is a set of points, it's invariant. So, but, and there are infinity of them, and it's a dense set, but nevertheless, it's a set of measures zero. So the arguments of Berry and Voros was that the eigenfunctions will only be on invariant sets of measure which is not zero. And because these orbits formed a set of measure zero, unlike in the case of integrable cases, the set of measure zero, therefore, they did not expect or said that, well, we can, we can, uh, we can believe that the Wigner function in these objects is, in, in these systems is not going to be concentrated on these lower dimensional invariant sets, but on the full measure set, which is just the energy shell and nothing else. H equals E. Oops. So the argument went that this Wigner function for a completely non-integrable state so by the way, so in a non-integrable, fully chaotic system, we have the state psi n, which depends on energy. I mean, the energy depends on this. And there is one energy shell, classically, which corresponds to that energy. So actually, there is an association of a quantum state, a single quantum state, to an energy shell, corresponding to that energy En. So an entire state is related, one state is related to an entire energy shell, just as in the harmonic oscillator, one state was related to this orbit. But it's a much more larger object here. And the Wigner function, it's invariant on that. So if the, if the state had some energy, so maybe I, instead of psi, I'll just use the E. divided by the integral so that's the Berry Voros hypothesis there are many hypotheses in this it's difficult to prove most of them there are there are suggestions and there are interesting physical mechanisms of why they would happen, why one might expect that, beyond what I just talked about. But nevertheless, it's not rigorously proven. And also, if you take a particular eigenstate again and do its Wigner function, you're not going to see that. You will expect to see that only if you do some kind of an local averaging. So maybe I will just call that with a bar. Just as what, why would we need to do local averaging is that there will be oscillations on a de Broglie wavelength, uh, uh, very fast uh, oscillations, and we would want to just smoothen over that uh, slightly so that we, uh, we, we don't, uh, 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 so that we are getting something smooth in the classical limit. Okay, so there is some local averaging which is going on here. So after a local averaging, we can expect this, but what is this? This is just the microcanonical ensemble. So, essentially, the Berry Voros hypothesis is a hypothesis about the Wigner function being a microcanonical ensemble. But of course, there's no ensemble. It's just one eigenstate of one chaotic system, of one system like the stadium billiard. There's no ensemble. It's one particle. So. And the interesting thing is that, although that looks like something which is uh, not so deep, we are just saying that it's like, okay, it's, uh, it's spread uniformly in some energy shell, it has a lot of predictive power. And so there are two predictions which it makes. 
and they, they come from properties of Wigner functions. So the Wigner function has this property that if you integrate out the momenta, you get the distribution or the, uh, the, the intensity of the state in the position representation. It has information about both position and momentum representations. And similarly, if you integrate this over the positions, you'll get the momentum representation. So you can take this hypothesis, integrate out the momentum, and see what is the resulting uh, uh, how the resulting intensity looks. That will again be what you expect after some local averaging in Q. Hmm? Yeah, so let's uh, look, for example, a harmonic oscillator, a highly excited state. It'll be, you know, having these very fine oscillations which are like this. But you know that if you do some local averaging, you don't uh, you, you don't put all of them together. Local averaging means that you, you take this part of it, you average the intensity, and you put that in that bin. Then you will get something which is nice and smooth, and in fact, it has a simple classical interpretation of the time the harmonic, classical harmonic oscillator spends in that region of space. You know, that's the... Only then it's a smooth thing, otherwise it will be having oscillations at very high, uh, very small wavelengths. But actually, quite interestingly, we have not washed out all of that information here. We might think that we have gone to something completely classical, but that's not true. And that's quite interesting, so let me see if I can make that point quickly. Yes, so left as an exercise, maybe we deal with this. So it's a, now if we assume a Hamiltonian, which is a quadratic in momenta, so assume that the Hamiltonian is of this form, p squared by twice m plus potential, standard form, large enough for us to study quantum chaos, then you can integrate out the momenta because it's just quadratic. So you can do that integral and show that the intensity in position space is given by this expression here. So d is the number of degrees of freedom, e minus v of q to the power d half minus 1. And this is just telling you that the wave function has to lie inside the allowed region. There's no tunneling in this, it's not taking into account tunneling. For example, the case of the oscillator, we saw wave functions of the shape, but the shape is just telling you the classically allowed region in space for the given energy. So that is just this theta E minus the potential. Okay, so that's restricting it within this, so that's, that's trivial. And then there is this, uh, I think e minus uh, v of q to the power d half minus 1. d equals 1. d equals 1 is 1 degree of freedom. This tells you is 1 over square root of e minus uh, uh, v of q. And you should know that already to some extent. And we just drew these kind of pictures. Why is it getting large here? Huh? What is special about these points? Yeah, but what is, what is special about these points? So the given energy, I've just plotted this, you know, this is some energy I can state, modulus psi n squared is what I plotted, harmonic oscillator. The classical turning points, right? This is when E equals V of Q. Total energy is the potential energy, there's no kinetic energy, it vanishes the classical turning points, it actually diverges, or it's very large. The classical limit, it diverges there. Huh? So, uh, the, uh, so these things are 
one-dimensional systems of this kind, and actually integrable systems are of this kind. Typical integrable systems on the boundary of classical boundaries, the wave function has points which are catastrophically large, and it has connections to catastrophe theory, caustics, and so on. They are very large. However, this predicts that it vanishes. If it is a non-integrable system, and d is greater than 1, it vanishes. d equals 2, it's exactly 0, and it's uniform. So it predicts a uniform distribution, just as what I uh, wrote, that if you do an averaging, it's basically a ratio of the area. It's how much area, fraction of the area over which you're doing the integration. So this already predicts that. So it's got that kind of a predictive power. And for d greater than 2, it is 0. It vanishes on these boundaries. On d equals 2. So Berry called these anti-caustics. So just this hypothesis, along with an integration, tells you these very interesting facts. And it's not just that, it's, you can also look at correlations. So you can look at correlations such as these, the wave function at x plus, at q plus x, so let's, let's take this, uh, a, a, a position q, and some direction x, and look at q plus x by 2, and q minus x by 2. At these two points, we are looking at the wave function, and we are looking at the correlation in the amplitude of these wave functions. Okay, so that's what this is. A correlation at the point Q in the direction X, and we can normalize it by the intensity of the wave function at the point Q. So this two-point correlation can be calculated using this hypothesis. It's very easy because of the following fact. You see the definition of the Wigner function is got exactly this form. So how will you find this form, given this, and given the Wigner function? No, we don't want this integral over. We want actually this. We want it at q and x. You understand the question? We know the Wigner function. That's this hypothesis. We don't know this. That's, what the, that's the correlation we need. What will you do? What integral? Be more precise. It's staring you in the face. Exactly. Good, thanks. So it's an inverse Fourier transform of this. So do an inverse Fourier transform of the delta function here. Okay? Again, use this form p squared by 2m plus v of q, and then this was derived by Berry uh, early uh, in, in the 80s, that this is actually a Bessel function of order depending on the degrees of freedom. And x and p, x is only the magnitude of the vector capital X. And q and p is this momentum, square root of 2m e minus v of q. It's a local momentum. It's the momentum at the point q energy E. Okay, so that's not, it's a magnitude of the momentum. And uh, it's a Bessel function, it actually dies down. You should plot this, I've plotted this, for example, taking d minus 1 by 2 to be 3 uh, divided by x cubed. You can see that it's, it's small and then it oscillates and it basically dies down after a small value of x. So it tells you that if x is larger than h bar by p, there is practically no correlations between in these states. And that is the local de Broglie wavelength of the state. So it tells you that after a few de Broglie wavelengths, there is no correlation in these states. It dies down that fast. And also it's isotropic. It does not depend on the direction of x. So it's an isotropic correlation which is just decaying fast, beyond a few de Broglie wavelengths, it's dead. So this is a very interesting viewpoint, I mean, it's a very interesting thing, and it actually forms the basis of what Shretnicki took up uh, in 1994 and called eigenstate thermalization. The story starts from actually this particular formula here, 
and as, as you can see, it's already some. It, it's uh, uh, it, it's it's got some microcanonical ensemble in it. But if you go back and ask how good such prediction is, there has been not that many works on this. But actually, uh, in the case of billiards, this is a work by Kaufman, McDonald in 1989, I think, and. Uh, uh, here are eigenfunctions of a circular billiard. Okay. And uh, basically, it's one of those, we, we saw that it's one of them is along the circle kind of thing. I think it's one of those states, so it's very regular. And if you looked at the correlations, the correlations dip, are anisotropic, and they don't fall off. They are actually pretty oscillatory. It just goes on like this. It's not that great data, but this is for the stadium billiard. And what is plotted is uh, uh, three different uh, uh, three different directions, so they look fairly uh, fairly isotropic, and the oscillations are you know this is the Bessel function which is put in there, and there are these deviations from these which are I believe also predictable if you take this model and calculate what is the uh, what is the uh, uh, what is the uh, uh, expected deviation. Because if you think of this as an average, what is the expected deviation? And then you will find that these are consistent with that expected deviation. So this is a positive uh, uh, support for, uh, for the berry boros hypotheses. Hmm? No, it's anisotropic. It's, uh... ah, yeah. The, but the eigenfunctions are not. I mean, it's like, for example, you look at this eigenfunction, clearly, I mean, if I'm somewhere here, it depends on which way I'm going. I mean, the eigenfunctions are not looking the same all over the place. I mean, even if you take something which is a circular symmetry, there is a, a certain uh, direction, the radial direction along which maybe you will expect some... Uh, even there, I don't know whether you expect a correlation. Only the, only the angular direction you might expect that there is no... Uh, that it's invariant along that. Exactly. So the Bessel function, so I'll come to that, uh, uh, not today, I guess, but it's, it's, it's random functions and especially Gaussian random functions which have isotropic, uh, isotropic correlations like these, as well as Bessel function DK of this kind. So in fact, these are, uh, these are evidence that these eigenfunctions are essentially random waves or, uh, or Gaussian uh, random functions are a good description of that. Hmm? So, again, I mean, you could do this calculation with the, uh, uh, with the correlations, but that's, so in, in fact, it's very closely related to, yeah, five minutes, or five minutes, yeah. So, it's rather closely related to this, uh, uh, to this, uh, uh, to this construction, whatever I talked about, and the fact that there's is isotropy and a DK, which is Bessel function-like. But maybe I just motivate that slightly differently, and also pose a particular problem. If you take uh, central force, central forces, so constrained particle on a plane, and you ask what are the kind of orbits that you may have. Central force problem, Goldstein. Not necessarily Kepler problem, okay? Uh, so now, uh, it's, it can do, you know, there's some Bertrand's theorem, and, but can it cross each other? I'm drawing now, not in phase space, in coordinate space. It can cross. There is no uh, problem. There is uh, in, only in phase space it cannot cross. It can cross, but how many times can it cross the same point? Can it cross? There is. Can it do? Can it come like this? Cross it like that? Then do this. Cross it like that. The same point. Can it cross with many different velocities? Basically, that's what it's saying. If you sit at one particular point, can it cross with? all possible directions. Answer is no, you can figure it out because you know enough classical mechanics and you figure out that there are only two possible directions of 
momenta at any given point for a central force. Either goes on one way or the other way. That's it. And it's related to the fact that the motion in phase space is a two torus. However, for a non-integrable system, that's what was well appreciated by Einstein in 1917, there's no such compunction. We saw this billiard, it was crossing all over the place, and that it can cross with any possible momentum at a given point, a given point in space. So this was a, mo this was a model which was built on this uh, uh, fact, and which is related to the berry voros hypothesis, is that locally then we can think of, at any given point, we can think about plane waves which are coming in, in all possible directions. In all possible directions, but with the constraint that the uh, magnitude of the momentum is fixed, because it's fixed by the energy, and the where you're sitting, namely square root of 2m e minus v. Oops, that's magnitude of momentum. So the magnitude is fixed, but not the direction. So you take waves, which are plane waves, superpose them, many of them, this n has no meaning strictly at this, at this stage, uh, some amplitudes, which are random amplitudes, say we draw them from a normal distribution with unit uh, variance, and uh, uh, actually there should be an index n on these uh, uh, wave numbers, so it, it depends on this n here, so kxn and kyn, but the directions are random, but their magnitude is fixed by the energy E. In the case of the billiard, there is no potential. So it's fixed by, well, I didn't write here, I guess, there's 2m E by h bar squared, but essentially energy. So you take a random superposition of plane waves. You can also put in random faces for good measure. And you ask, how is this random wave looking? And in fact, that is this for the same number of uh, uh, energy, for the same energy comparable to this cardioid billiard, this is a random wave model. So it's just superposition of random waves with, uh, 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 with amplitudes which are random but with fixed wave number. But the direction of the wave vector is also random. And you see the similarity in terms of structures. People expected probably something like speckles at particular points, intensities, but instead there are these, uh, there are these curves along which there are uh, the, there's intensity amplifications. And also, the, it implies that the, uh, the amplitude of the wave function itself is a normal distribution. This one is essentially from central limit theorem because we are uh, summing a lot of uh, random variables. So here is a, a, a comparison of an actual eigenfunction amplitudes and an expected normal distribution. It's very good. So basically, the statistical properties, and when we discuss random matrix theory tomorrow, we will see that random matrices have essentially such a character as well. Okay? So, the amplitudes of these states, if you look at it in any basis, looks essentially a normal distribution. Okay, so I, uh, uh, the exceptions to these are the scars, and there is a well-developed theory of scars, uh, 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 but it is uh, understood today that scars are, while important for single wave functions, for collective properties, they're not that crucial and they would not impact that much. Okay, so uh, I, I doubt if I have time to go into quantum maps, but uh, uh, maybe a little bit before I go on to random matrix theory tomorrow. Any quick questions? All right, I think we break, thank you. <laughs>